How's the face start flight? Roger. Plus H start. We're burning flat. Roger. 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 Looks good, flat. How's the face start flight? Roger. Plus H start. Looks good, flat. I started up with my feet. Boy, well, I don't put my visor up. Crazy. Fantastic, sports fans. Technology has enabled us to reach far beyond the confines of our planet. This same technology that has taken us into outer space is also helping us to explore our own planet. The seas and oceans of the world cover nearly three quarters of its surface. This inner space, as it's been called, is almost as inaccessible as the distant planets. The deep sea, just like deep space, is an environment where man is alien, and where at best he can be little more than a temporary visitor descending briefly to explore before returning to the surface. But today, as our increasing demand for energy takes us deeper into the oceans, there is a need for something more permanent on the seabed than man himself. It was eight years ago that this project was conceived. One might say also that it was 360 million pounds ago. It represents a, a vision of both Shell and Esso that subsea production systems will be part and parcel of our business in the years to come. I'm sure we would all join together in wishing the project Godspeed. This is the UMC the underwater manifold center. In just a few days time, it'll be down on the bottom of the North Sea. But it carries no crew, for it is in effect a giant robot. And from its seabed location over the next 25 years, it'll produce billions of gallons of oil, entirely by remote control. Back there in Rotterdam, John Jennings spoke of a project that spanned eight years and uh, 360 million pounds. Actually, the story goes back much further than that. In 1968, Exxon established a team in California to <clears throat> develop a means of producing oil in deep water. We knew at the time that uh, eventually we were going to have to produce oil in uh, water depths beyond the depth of uh, platform capability. The, uh, out of that effort came the, the SPS, or the Submerged Production System. This unit was installed in the Gulf of Mexico in 1974 and was tested for approximately five years to prove the concept and uh, capability to reach into these deep water depths. This subsea production system was Exxon's answer to the problem of developing oil and gas fields in deep waters. But why go to the effort of putting all this down on the seabed, beyond the reach of human hands? As oil was discovered in deeper waters, bigger platforms had to be built. Huge structures in concrete and steel were being installed in the North Sea and elsewhere. Some, like this one, as tall as a 30-story building, even on their side. Eventually, there comes a point where it's really not feasible to build them any bigger. So, instead, you put some of those facilities right down on the seabed itself. 
Five years of testing showed that such systems would work. In doing so, it encouraged the search for oil in deeper waters, previously considered inaccessible. But it was not only deep water production that concerned oil companies. Their exploration efforts in the 60s and 70s had discovered many smaller fields in relatively shallow waters closer inshore. However, often it was just not economic to build a conventional platform to develop these small or awkwardly shaped reservoirs. A new approach was needed. Here in Britain, Shell developed this small, remotely controlled well, first used in the shallow seas off Brunei. Called a satellite well, it sits on the seabeds, connected to a conventional platform some distance away. In this way, it provides a relatively inexpensive means of reaching parts of the field too small to justify a complete, full-scale platform. So, in the early 70s, Shell, with these satellite wells, and Exxon, with their submerged production system, were each absorbed in subsea technology. Here in Britain's North Sea, Shell was already in joint venture with Exxon's European counterpart, Esso, successfully developing oil and gas fields. So in 1974, the two decided to pool their experience and produce a subsea production system for use in the North Sea. And in this part of the world, being down on the seabed would keep it well away from weather like this. Southwest to five, increasing six or seven, perhaps scale eight later. Rain at times, moderate to four. John Jennings again. We decided to go subsea because it was really a natural development from our earlier experience in the Far East. We saw here in the North Sea. Uh, a whole range of new prospects, many of them small fields in uh, what we now come to know as conventional water depths, say down to 500 feet. We saw also prospects emerging in somewhat deeper water, and we saw the need and opportunity to create a new production system which could be used for both sorts of field. The field chosen for this first installation was Shell Esso's Cormorant Field, 450 kilometres northeast of Aberdeen. We chose to apply the UMC to the Cormorant field uh, for very practical reasons. We have two platforms there, and we can't reach all the oil from those platforms because the field is a very long, narrow field. And so Cormorant, the central Cormorant, became a natural place to put the UMC to its first test. Chief Engineer Don Henry. The design, which took four years, was based to a certain extent on the Exxon SPS development work, which was for a three-well template. The Moneyfall Center, however, is a nine-well template. And in addition to the expertise brought in by Exxon, there was the additional expertise brought in from Brunei by Shell personnel, which allowed the Moneyfall Center to be not just template wells, but a combination of template and satellite wells. In all, the team spent some three years on the design work. By 1978, the team's designs on paper were being translated into steel here at the fabrication yard in Holland. The underwater manifold centre, as high as a four-storey building and big enough to cover half a football pitch. It would certainly be the most advanced piece of equipment ever launched in the North Sea. On its seabed location, the UMC acts as a template that means that wells are drilled through it from a surface vessel some 170 metres above. The drill string goes down through the UMC to reach the oil-bearing structures over 10,000 feet below. Drilling can also be deviated to tap the reservoirs at distances up to one and a half kilometres away. To tap parts of the reservoirs even further away, up to four kilometres, satellite wells are used. They are drilled from the surface in the same way as the template wells. Then, each completed well is capped by what is called a Christmas tree, a valve. Oil flows up through the Christmas tree and through pipelines to the UMC, 
where it joins oil from the other wells. From here, it flows to the Cormorant Alpha platform some seven kilometers away. Cormorant Alpha is, in effect, a giant pumping station which, after initially treating the oil, sends it ashore by pipeline. The platform also pumps treated water down to the UMC to maintain the natural pressure in the reservoir and keep the oil flowing. It goes via water injection wells and down into the reservoir. At its peak, the UMC will be producing up to two million gallons of crude oil every day. During those 25 years on the seabed, it will have to be accessible for maintenance and servicing, and yet, one of the UMC's design requirements was that it must be capable of working in depths far greater than these and far beyond the reach of divers. This gave the engineers their greatest challenge. And this was their answer. A remote maintenance vehicle, quite remarkable piece of engineering, first used by Exxon in the Gulf of Mexico, and here being tested in the dry on the UMC itself in Holland. In practice, when it's needed, it's taken offshore by this vessel. Once the vessel's over the UMC, it sends down a signal. This releases a buoy, which brings a line up to the surface. Using this line, the maintenance vehicle descends to the UMC, landing on a track running through its center. It's then remotely controlled by an operator back at the surface. In this rehearsal, he's moving it along the track to the unit that needs to be inspected or replaced. On its mission, the RMV is able to perform a number of tasks. Here, it's actually performing a valve changing operation, something it might be called upon to do in the future in water over a thousand feet deep. But there are some essential tasks that even the RMV is unable to perform. Deep within the UMC and the wells themselves, there are valves to be serviced and surveys to be carried out. To do this work, the engineers use what they call the through flow line or TFL system. These are precision tools arranged in a string. Each one is individually shaped with the accuracy of a key to carry out a specific function. They're fed into the system at the platform end and pumped down fluid-filled lines to the UMC, a round trip of perhaps over 20 kilometers. They enter the UMC here and are then routed to where they're needed. Their tasks vary from servicing safety systems to carrying out surveys right down inside a well itself. With such reliance on equipment, it was important to put every single item through its paces. A period of intensive testing, as thorough as that on any space program, was begun in 1980. As a part of that test program, a single satellite well, the P1, was placed in the field and connected to Cormorant Alpha. Although P1 was a test well, it would also recover oil from that part of the reservoir not reached by Cormorant Alpha or the UMC. It was, however, primarily an opportunity to test the technology involved in this new type of underwater work. Over the next 18 months, the successful results of the land testing and the highly reliable operation of the P-1 well confirmed that the UMC was ready for launch. And that's where we came in, with the departure of the UMC from Holland.
the early hours of May the 18th, 1982. The crane barge Hermod waits on location. We have one. Uh, Bill Gamage, project team engineer. The children will be checking immediately. I think we made uh, one to two hours, but we should be able to tell you probably within 30 or 40 minutes after we're on board that you can begin ballasting operations. Okay, well, I'll tell you what to do then. I got the welders over there, got the riggers over there, got the lines laid out, everything rigged up, and we just wait for a word for you. If you tell Rob, which is on the barge, yeah, that mm -hmm. you uh, check out is perfect, so we can start ballasting that uh, P2 into P5, and we can start cutting the C5 in that. Weather was perfect, the sea almost flat and mirror-like. The UMC, centerpiece of a 360 million pound project, starts the first stage of its journey to the seabed. The engineers were pleased itself was about as we expected. It didn't dive as deep as the calculation said. It was very much like the SPS, our previous experience. So it didn't even go underwater all the way. Very good. All the way. And now it's coming alongside, which will get this uh, line on. A lot, a lot of the most tedious parts going to be over. It looks like the weather is it's calm enough that uh, we're not going to have enough hook motion to give us any problems with lowering, so... I look for the rest of it to be as uneventful as this. It's been a piece of cake. What you see there now is uh, the way it's... Project manager, it's Tom Bastiance. It's perfect. It's uh, within half a meter on all sides uh, with our predictions that were uh, calculated by a computer. And uh, really we uh, couldn't, have, couldn't have expected anything better than this. Uh, the next uh, thing that's going to happen is that they are uh, going to attach these uh, large white nylon strings uh, to the 500 ton hook. And uh, then once they got that in the hook, they'll start ballasting and trimming, making sure that the thing is perfectly level. Computers are fine at making predictions, but it's men that have to struggle with the hardware. Now they can begin flooding the buoyancy tanks to take the UMC down to the seabed. They followed its progress on closed-circuit TV, pictures obtained from remotely controlled cameras. Now came the task of landing it accurately on the seabed. Down here, transponders had already been laid. They sent out signals to guide the UMC accurately onto the target area. Twelve hours after launching, the UMC, all 2,000 tons of it, touched down on the seabed, stirring up the silt. They've actually placed it within one meter of its target. 
they are justifiably pleased. Oh, very good. That's a good one. Oh, it smiles all the way. Now, it really works good. Two very slightly large customers. Now the UMC has to be plumbed in, connected to its parent platform, Corman and Alpha. To do so, the team employed a somewhat unusual technique. What you see there is a length of pipeline floating just beneath the surface. It's one of a number of pipe bundles that had been assembled on land here at Wick, on the northeast Scottish coast. Each line consists of almost four kilometers of pipe made up into a single string. There were a number of unique aspects to this system, not least the design which involved placing pipes within pipes. Oil and through flow lines are placed inside steel pipes which are packed with insulating material. These lines are placed inside even larger steel pipelines to provide protection down on the seabed. Finally, like some modern Cleopatra's needle, the whole four kilometer length is towed off the beach and out to sea. Not far from this beach at Wick Harbor, other lines were being prepared, electric cables and hydraulic control lines. Resembling a giant garden hose, they were wound onto reels and drums aboard the vessels that would take them to sea. Out on the field, they're unwound onto the seabed. Down here, work that in the past might have needed divers was being done by small remote controlled vehicles. Just a few years ago, this would have been considered science fiction. These mechanical insects fuss around the UMC, clearing debris, cutting cables, and attaching wires. And the cameras watch it all. All of the UMC's functions are controlled remotely at the surface aboard Cormorant Alpha. This is the main control panel for the UMC, and on it, it contains valves and pressure points to monitor the pressure subsea and the valve positions. They are laid out in a mimic fashion that corresponds to the layout of the UMC itself. From here, we can open and close valves by the push buttons and also monitor subsea pressures simply by pressuring the pressure indicators. The alarm and shutdown panel alerts the operator to any platform related alarms and if it is necessary, he can instantly shut down the UMC. The first well was drilled throughout the winter of 1982. And by the spring, the first Christmas tree was being installed, lowered through the center of the drilling vessel. Now, first oil was just four weeks away. With the headlines, Michael Foote spends the day wooing voters in the West Midlands, the world's most advanced underwater oil system. In the North Sea, system. oil is now flowing from the world's most advanced underwater UMC production system. a unique production system, and what makes it so different? From the project has gone very well indeed, considering that it is probably the most advanced underwater project that has been executed in the world, and taking the fact that it has been executed in one of the worst weather areas in the world, in the North Sea, I think the project team have a lot to be proud of. I think it's enormously important. We have a technology which can both develop the smaller oil and gas field in conventional water depths, depths down to, say, 600 feet, as well as having a technology which can bring us into much deeper water, water over 1,000 feet deep. Uh, and for Shell Expo, of course, that means that we shall be in a position to take advantages of this technology in developing some of our new prospects here in the North Sea. Unlike the Cormorant Alpha platform, 
UMC hides its light 170 meters below the surface. It represents a revolution in underwater oil and gas production. Although here it's installed in 500 feet of water, the basic design can be modified to work in much greater depths, 2,000 feet or more. It has shown the way towards future oil field development in deeper waters and in conjunction with floating production systems. A giant leap for mankind was how the pioneers of deep space described their success. Down here, the pioneers tend to view their work a little more modestly. Perhaps the last word should go to one of them. Tom Childers. It's just another step in a long chain of events that have to all operate successfully. And if we can continue uh, at this pace for another 20 years, we've uh, met our objectives.